Hi, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of AIHR Live. My name is Nadi Valinden. I will be your host today. I hope everyone is doing well. Do not hesitate, as always, to say hi to us in the comments and to let us know where you're watching from, because we really appreciate it. With me here today, as you can see, is Eric Van Volpen, founder of AIHR. Hi, Eric. Hi, Neely. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you, Eric. How are you? I'm doing very good. Looking forward to our conversation, I hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. I'll get to, back to you in a minute, Eric, uh, so you can say a few words about yourself. Um, but back to you, uh, our audience now first. So what we will be doing, Eric and I will be talking about uh, building digital capabilities in HR teams today. So we'll discuss what kind of digital capabilities there are, where to get started, how to go about the upskilling process, and we'll also take a look at what other future-oriented HR capabilities um, are important. We will be doing that for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then towards the end of the episode, as always, we'll have time to answer as many of your questions as possible. So, if you have any questions for Eric, or if you have any feedback or thoughts, do not hesitate to share them with us in the comments, because we really like to have that interaction with you. All right, Eric, back to you. Uh, I already said founder of AIHR, but also, of course, leader in upskilling, digital HR, and uh, people analytics. Uh, perhaps you want to say a few words about yourself to the audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Eric van Vulpen. I founded the Academy to Innovate HR, uh, AIHR, about five years ago. Um, and my focus has always been on teaching uh, HR professionals future-oriented skills, whether it's people analytics, digital skills, or any other functional uh, uh, capacity that you know you need to know in order to be ready for the future of work. That's what I've been focusing on in my studies and now in my in my my working career with a. Uh, uh, and that's that's been a, 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 an a amazing fun maybe. So that's a very brief introduction about myself. Yes, thank you very much for that, Eric. Um, I think we can get started right away. So um, to give a bit of context, we can perhaps start with why are uh, digital capabilities so important for HR teams? I think digital capabilities are, you know, if you ask the average HR professional working in a large organization, are you in a digital transformation at the moment? you have a 99% success rate that people are actually in a digital transformation. And that is not because digital is new. I think, you know, when we talk about a real digital transformation, that was back in the 70s and the 80s when we moved from typewriters to, you know, word processing systems on, on personal computers. But now something different is happening. Why are so many of us, so many of our organizations in digital transformations and you know, also the HR organizations? And I think that has to do with, with, with two aspects because on the one hand, over the last you know, 40 years, we've had a lot of point digital solutions that, that solve smaller problems, but now digital is really coming close to us as, as workers, as professionals. Digital is being seamlessly integrated in the way we work on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's also a horizontal integration of different uh, tools. So for example, when you when you look at HR, um, and, you know, you have an applicant tracking system in which you do your, your hiring and your selection, um, but when you hire someone and you know um, that, that, that they qualify for four out of five criteria, but the fifth criteria, which would be, for example, project management, they haven't really mastered it yet, but you still think it's a good fit, so you hire this person. Ideally, this ATS is integrated with your learning management system. And then the first day when this new employee starts in the job, the learning management system pops open and says, you know, you need to improve on your project management skills. Here's a course that you can follow. That kind of horizontal integration between tools, I think, is, is one of the key driving forces. And what I said earlier already, this, this seamless integration of digital in the way we work is, is the other driving force. And this, this brings us to the digital capabilities that, that HR needs. HR needs to be able to, to, to coordinate the process, drive that process, and build digital capabilities, not just in HR to enable this, but also in the broader business. Yes. 
I think that was a really uh, extensive uh, answer, Eric. Thank you very much for that. And now, of course, you can perhaps guess it. I would like to know if you can give us an example, perhaps, of this. That's a good question. I'll, I'll give two examples of, of two common processes. Uh, the, the first process that, that is commonly referred to uh, when we talk about digital transformation and digital capabilities is digitization. Digitization is the process of going from a pen and paper solution to a digital solution. And an example is, for example, uh, Grolsch, which is part of the Ashai uh, Brewery Group. Um, they had a compensation and benefit system, which was uh, eight A4 papers that you had to fill in manually and you had to, it was a compensation cafeteria system, so you could choose your own benefits. And, you know, you would hand it in to the, to the administrator, they would type it into the system, and, you know, the next month you would get it paid. And if there was a mistake in the, in the, in the system, you know, there, there um, uh, was a lot of hassle and you had to go back. And that was a manual system. What they did, they implemented a, a, a benefits system, I think it was called My Benefits, about a year ago, that replaced that entire process. This led to the process being much more efficient. Um, the HR administrator who used to be in between now got a more tactical role and is able to uh, give advice to specific people on you know, which benefits would fit them best, their circumstances, because yeah. you know that an administrative role is not needed anymore. And at the same time, customer satisfaction, I, I, I don't know the exact number, but jumped by about two points from, I think, a 6.4 to a, a an 8.3 so the, you know the specific employee experience for this part of the of the employee journey increased tremendously so um, i think that's that's a good example of of digitization and then you have automation as well and automation is the process of um, making sure that a lot of the um, the processes that are now you know repeatable uh, uh, making them scalable and doing them in a fully digital way um, and i can give you an example of that as well um, for example um, when we stick to benefits, uh, a friend of mine used to work in, in benefits and he worked on, um, he, he got input from managers about how they would reward their high performance and he would then manually put it in a system, you know, and they would match it. He would, to, uh, uh, he, he would match those systems of records and then he would enter it. You know, that's, that's about automation, getting that person uh, uh, out of it, not because it's a paper-based system, but because you let two different systems communicate with each other. And again, you have an efficiency win um, uh, that is fantastic. Mm. Yes. So we have digitization and automation that you mentioned. I'd like to talk uh, for a second, Eric, about uh, the actual digital capabilities. Um, so if I listen to your examples just now, I have an idea what they will be like, but perhaps you can tell us what are the different digital capabilities? You, you, you're, you're attempting, uh, you're pinning me down, Neely. You're trying to, uh, to define what digital capabilities exactly are. Um, for us at, at AIHR, we define it, uh, digital capabilities, the, the key ones, we call them digital integration. And it's about uh, awareness of what's going on, you know, in terms of technology in the organization and outside of the organization, and then embedding it in your uh, HR practices, your HR processes, um, to create uh, impact in both HR and in the business. And that's still a bit of an abstract uh, definition. So I'll, I'll make it very concrete. For us, this, this digital integration has three elements. On the one hand, the digital culture builder. So as an HR professional, you need to build a digital culture, not just within HR, but also in the broader organization. If you look at you know, the skills gap, um, uh, it's huge. And the biggest skill gap is on digital skills throughout the workforce. And a recent survey, they showed that for 2020, that's the biggest skill gap. And also for 2025, it was predicted to be the biggest skill gap, you know, being able to work with different digital tools. So there's a fantastic responsibility for HR that, you know, only HR should pick up the digital culture builder. The second one is technology awareness, knowing what's happening when it comes to technology outside of the organization, uh, you know, random technology, not HR related, but also your HR related technology. Because if you don't have that hyper awareness of what's going on in the world around you, you know, you're going to miss out and, and technology will, 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 will pass you by and you'll lose your competitive edge. That's technology awareness. And the third one is technology embedder. You need to be able to embed technology into your HR practices so you create a more efficient HR process, uh, but also create more HR uh, uh, effectiveness. So HR is 
you know, not only uh, doing HR in a faster way, you know, efficiency, but also in a more um, uh, um, goal-oriented way. So there's HR effectiveness. We're able to reach our goals in a better way through technology. And through doing that, we can also make more business impact. So when we talk about digital integration, it's about the digital culture builder, technology awareness, and uh, the technology embedder. Those are the three key capabilities that I think are key for the future nearly. Yeah, beautiful, Eric. I'm going to repeat them one more time so that they stick with me. So we've got the culture builder, the culture builder, we have the um, technology awareness, and then we have the um, technology embedder, right? Exactly. Um, and this it brings me to uh, something else I, uh, I'm curious about, Eric, which is um, does everybody in HR teams need to uh, acquire digital capabilities? And if yes, does everybody need to acquire these three types that we just mentioned? So culture, technology awareness, and then embedder. What are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. Um, everyone should have uh, at least a minimum level of digital awareness. A, a good example of a skill that everyone should have is you need to be able to quickly adapt to new digital tooling because we'll get more and more new digital tooling that will keep updating and you need to have that intuitive sense of how do I work with digital tools, for example. But there are also skills that you don't necessarily, you know, not everyone needs, but every HR organization needs to have at least a few people with these skills. Uh, an example is how do you select from the tens of thousands of HR vendors, you know, the solution that will work for your organization, that uh, a buying process, how do you go through it and having experience in that? It's not something that everyone will have to, uh, will have to learn, but it is a skill that every HR organization should at least have. Another example is be able to build a digital strategy and, and a digital roadmap of how you can advance the organization. Not everyone needs to do that, but your senior leaders at least need to have a clear understanding of where you are and where you want to go whenever it comes to, you know, to, to digital capabilities and, and digital efforts in the organization. Um, and of course, if, if you're someone who is working in, in Compact Ben or in, or in global mobility or whatever COE you're active in, you need to know the, the HR tooling that is relevant, at least in your specialization. So not everyone needs to know exactly the same, but some of the basic skills you all need to have. And for your different functions, you need to have your core, your basic knowledge, uh, because that is very important to do a good job, not just now, but also, you know, in 2025 and in 2030. Mm. Yes, yes. And I can imagine, for instance, when we look at this technology awareness part that you mentioned, I can imagine, especially in larger organizations with larger teams, that perhaps one or two people are staying on top of that. And then within the organization, they share whatever they see is happening. And they do these kinds of, I think, internal workshops almost where they make sure everybody has a certain level of awareness. Yeah, exactly. Because you want you want that that awareness for for everybody. And if you, if you work in in automotive and you you know you didn't see electric driving coming uh, five years ago, you know, and you're just hooking on uh, uh, to give a to give a, a bit of a delayed example, you know, that is not a position where you want to be. And so you want indeed those those scouts to be on the lookout. And whenever they they see new trends happening, you want them to bring it in the organization and share it with everyone. So there is at least a common understanding of what's coming up next. When it is, you know, when it comes to digital uh, digital disruption in your industry, in your organization. Yes, absolutely, um, Eric. I want to go more to the um, to the actual more practical part uh, of this of this process. So let's say I'm a, a rather large uh, organization and I really want to get started. Hopefully, you already did, but you know, I want to um, start building these digital capabilities within my HR team. Um, before I think we get to the actual building of the capabilities, there's some homework that needs to be done, right? Can you can you perhaps guide us through that process? What 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 needs to happen? Yeah, so the first step is usually attaching it to the business and HR strategy. Uh, so whenever you you know you want to invest in digital capabilities, there's a reason for it. And I think that's the first step to go for. Um, understanding how does, you know, building these digital capabilities, how does that relate to your organizational strategy? Because if there's no hook to your strategy, you're probably focusing on the wrong thing. Now, I think for most organizational strategies, you know, building this digital uh, awareness and building these digital capabilities are definitely connecting to being competitive in the market, uh, being an, in, an innovative company, you know, it is con connected to the strategy. And once you have that hook in the, in the strategy, 
um, uh, that is that is your first key step. And then I think you have three more steps. Um, so second, you want to define what are then the core competencies that you need, you know, when it comes to digital uh, skills uh, or other future oriented skills that you need to improve on. Um, and that could be, you know, the, the way I explained uh, uh, how we define digital integration. There can be some nuances, um, um, but you need to define what, you know, good performance potentially looks like. And then you do in the third step, your skills gap analysis, where you look, where are we today and where do we want to go? You know, what is the desired outcome and what is the current state? Um, and then, then the fourth step is to make an implementation plan on how do we go from, you know, from A to B, from the as is to the to B. And, and how do we do that, you know, on the one hand with the systems and the tools that we probably need to integrate, but also, you know, when it comes to capability building, how do you, um, uh, how do you get from A to B and what are the steps that you should take? So that's, that's a four step process that I would, I would say on a very high level, at least, and we can talk mm -hmm. about this for, for an entire episode, maybe, but on a very high yes. level that you need to, to go through. I know. I know we can talk about it for an entire episode, Eric, but that was very clear. So there's four steps. Uh, I'm going to try and repeat them again. Um, first, find a hook with the with the business culture. Find a hook. Then look at the um, capabilities you need. Uh, then there's going to be the skills gaps and skill gaps analysis. Sorry, and then of course you need to start. Uh, taking action so these are the four steps um which of course then leads me to a logical next question eric i can i'm sure you can see it coming already which is um once you have all that done um what does uh, the upskilling process look like yeah i i had a feeling that question was coming maybe so um i i think a good example to give would be a fortune 500 company that we're working with at the moment on exactly a journey like this where we you know they have a very clear strategy that is connected to this and they have a number of, of learning objectives uh, specifically when it comes to digital capabilities so they have clearly stated objectives and then what we do based on those objectives we create a number of learning journeys so we already concluded earlier that not everyone needs the exact same capabilities so we specify yeah. different personas and we create learning journeys for each of those personas now, the next step is to create timelines. So do you want to you know, go through that learning journey in six months, in 12 months, in two years? Depending on your priority, this, this, this timeline will be different. And then in those timeline, we cut the timeline in 10 different pieces. And for e each of those pieces, we create different activities. So we say, for example, you first follow, you know, uh, say five or six lessons, two different modules. Um, and then afterward, you have an assignment, and that's a moment when you all come together as, as different learners from one organization. There's a facilitator, there's in-house expertise, and there's external expertise, and you start to evaluate on what you've learned, and you try, and I think this is the most important, you try to apply it to your business problems. And then with the facilitators, you, you select a number of problems, and you say, how can I um, take the learnings that we had in these uh, different modules and apply it to this concrete situation? And that way you have a very interactive process where people ideally you know, have free time to do so. Um, so they have scheduled time off to do their actual learning and to work on these organizational improvement plans. Um, it is connected to internal priorities. And in the end of this program, so you, say you go through it in six months, at the end of this program, you. Uh, have a committee and you present your different projects, uh, uh, you, you, you end with a final assignment and this committee then selects one, two, three or maybe even more uh, tangible uh, assignments um, that should then be executed in the organization. And then you have a fantastic um, a learning journey with, with uh, ju just a few of the best practices that we implement in these learning journeys um, that is structured um, and that not only enables learning, uh, but also enables creating impact with this learning. And I think that's the most important part that you want knowledge to stick. And in order for it to make it stick, you want to apply it to the organization. And at the same time, when you apply it successfully, you advance the organization. So that's a very good way of, of doing it in an effective, impactful uh, a way. And I think a great example for uh, to answer your question. Yes, I think I think that that what you're saying at least uh, at the end, Eric, is super important because I think uh, too often uh, people go through certain l uh, learning um, courses and they learn, but there's not the next step where they actually put that those learnings into practice. And I think this is even better uh, what you are saying because it's not just 
putting those learnings into practice. No, it's actually putting them into practice within the organization uh, and ensuring that there is going to be a positive impact in the organization. So I think it's the best of both worlds, really. On the one hand, you have uh, the learning part, uh, which often still is, of course, mostly theoretically. And then on the other hand, you have the practical side of things where people can immediately um, apply into practice what they've been learning. So I think that's a fantastic and a really powerful uh, combination. Now, that partially answers something else I was wondering about, because of course, it's great to uh, upskill people to build digital capabilities in HR teams. But how do we know, how can we measure if someone actually masters uh, that the newly learned capabilities? Yeah, I, I partially answered this question already by looking, you know, at the impact yeah. that you make. So, for example, the, the new projects or initiatives that you have, um, but it can also be simpler. So, for example, new tools that you have, is the adoption rate of new tools, is that increasing as you build your digital capabilities, you know, in HR and in the broader organization? Um, and do we see increased engagement on existing tools? Uh, that's, for example, another fantastic, uh, uh, more impact-related metric. You can also have, you know, organizational assessments where you assess how effective is the organization at the moment in digital capabilities. With our coursework, we often do pre- and post-assessments um, where we uh, assess, you know, before learners start and afterwards, and then we try to, to measure what is the impact of the learning journey on how uh, people perceive themselves as being uh, digitally savvy, but also on the projects that they do. And I think there's also a, a cultural element where you can attach a number of success metrics to that I that I haven't mentioned yet, um, which which is focused on on do we actually see a change in the culture? Do we see an increase in 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 adoption? And do we see new projects? You know, uh, the, the the rate of innovation, the, so the number of new innovative projects. Do we see that increase? And do we see, um, you know, if innovation projects don't succeed, do we then at, uh, at least see some form of, of failing forward? So learning from these projects and do we see yeah. new uh, successful projects arise from these failed projects? Um, and I think these are three rough boxes that you can, 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 can select a, a number of metrics on that I think will, will enable you to measure this fairly accurately. Yes. Definitely. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience one second, Eric, uh, because I myself have one last question I uh, want to ask Eric, and then um, it's uh, over to you. So if you have any questions based on what we've just discussed, or if you have any thoughts that you would like to share, do not hesitate to do so in the comments, and we'll get to them after my next question for Eric. So Eric, here it is then, my, my final question uh, for you, which is, uh, we've been talking about digital capabilities, of course, and um, their importance for HR, but uh, at the Academy uh, to Innovate HR, we're of course helping uh, HR to get future ready. So what other, future-oriented uh, HR capabilities have you uh, identified, you know, when you speak to organizations, when you speak to HR professionals? Perhaps you can just give us a little bit of information on that. So there's the, the more traditional HR capabilities um, that we call the people's advocates, the role of HR as an, as an advocate for people, which includes culture building, uh, people and talent management, and ethics and compliance. But I think this is, in general, the, the most developed uh, capability in HR already. Digital integration, we spoke about this quite extensively now already. Mm -hmm. Those are the two, uh, two out of four of the, of the core capabilities that we've identified. And then I think the, the, the other two are, uh, on the one hand, data-driven. Um, so data driven is about, you know, the ability to make evidence based decisions and to uh, read, apply, create and uh, translate, communicate data as information to in the end influence decision making. So that means are you data literate? You know, can you read the data and are you an analytics translator? Can you uh, uh, work with findings from, for example, an analytics team or can you read reports and then directly apply it to your business context? to create value, so that's data-driven. And then fourth is business acumen. Do you have the ability to um, uh, understand the organization and its priorities, understand the end customer, so the person in the end who is, who is buying your product, um, and can you position uh, uh, HR in the organization and align it with what the business is doing? Um, so that, that has to do by or with or that involves uh, understanding the organizational context and its external context, 
understanding really the end customer and being able to position the HR uh, practices, the HR activities uh, in a way that delivers value to the business. So those are the four um, key core competencies that we see when it comes to future-oriented uh, uh, HR need. And uh, I'm, I'm about to yeah. summarize them, but uh, usually you summarize the answers so far. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you. I think you're just testing if I'm paying attention, Eric. I, uh, but I mean, if, if I did pay attention, then we've got uh, culture, right? Then we have the digital capabilities we spoke about. We've got the data-driven part. Uh, and we've got business acumen. And I imagine as uh, it goes for the digital capabilities, these are things as well that probably not everybody within HR needs to completely master these, but a certain awareness of each of these uh, future oriented uh, capabilities will be required. Yes, that makes sense. Ooh, okay, yeah. Well um, <laughs> all right, Eric, I'm gonna go to some uh, audience questions uh, for you now. Mm have the first one here which is actually about a culture builder um you mentioned earlier that hr needs to be a digital culture builder um do you have any tips on how to do that oh there's a, a, a lot of tips uh, i think one of the most tangible ways when it comes to culture building is the example that leadership sets um so in your leadership development programs to 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 uh, come up with a very specific interventions intervention in your leadership development program, you should focus, uh, first of all, to build these digital capabilities. Because um, you don't want to be in the situation where you have a VP in front of the room who is then, you know, waiting for IT to come in because they don't know how to how how a connector plugged into a computer, you know, even though you're sitting in the room and thinking, you know, I can just walk forward and, and do it for them. That kind of, you know, that, that doesn't set the right tone. If you want to be forward looking, a digital organization, you want your senior leadership team, you know, to be advocates to to evangelize it because that is the most effective way, or at least one of the most effective ways to build that culture. And then there are uh, there there's a, there's a whole array of uh, HR activities that you can do to, to build that culture it, when it comes to learning and development, but also the, the, the values that you, that you promote in your, in your different interactions with employees as HR and, 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 and also you know, uh, uh, how, you, how you coach the, the leadership team, what to put emphasis on. And I think uh, the last element is about you know, being a role model yourself, not just you know, the leaders, but also HR. If you want to establish this culture, you, know, you also need to have a minimum understanding of what digital means. Um, so you also need to develop it yourself to do so. Yeah, I agree. A great answer, I think, Eric. I have another question coming for you, um, which is... Um, Ah, good question. Uh, is it worth moving towards digital HR for smaller organizations? And the question is coming from Joe. <laughs> oh, that's a very good question, Joe. Um, mm. So, you know, AI HR is now an organization of about 35, uh, 35 people. Um, and, you know, to, to, to talk about a smaller organization, I think that qualifies as, as, as a smaller organization. Um, when, we, uh, uh, when, when, when I look at our systems, uh, we try to automate as much as we can. Uh, uh, and I have to admit that it, the, the, the only field in which we have some, uh, um, uh, well, we, we don't have any pen and paper solutions when it comes to, uh, when it comes to HR. Um, and and be, being able to, to, to lift up your, your, your system landscape, um, um, also for digital HR, I don't think there's much relevancy, you know, whether you're small or big, the, the activities that you have, they will, uh, they will differ. Uh, so in larger organization, you'll, you'll focus much more on this horizontal integration that I spoke about, you know, making different tools communicate with each other. In uh, smaller organizations, it will be, uh, uh, in that sense, you know, there's not really an economy of skill where that's gives a, a, a payoff. So the activities that you focus on will be different, but yeah, definitely at least have the basics in place, have a, have a good system, uh, a system of records, have a one source of truth that is, that is being managed, being owned by a single person, um, you know, and let that all be digital and uh, uh, throw out the, uh, the, the paper stuff in so far as possible. Um, uh, yeah, do, do that. So uh, I think that the, the kind of activities might differ a bit, uh, but yes, do focus on it. Um, but especially in smaller organizations, you'll have to, to make the distinction of, hey, 
do I have the economy of scale to really invest in this and to invest a lot of time and potentially money in buying a tool or in building a solution? Or, you know, should I take the the the, the still digital, but you know, should I do it in a in a Google Sheet or in a in a in a in an yeah. easier system? That's the that's that's the constant consideration that you have to make when you're in a smaller organization. Yeah, of course. Yes. I was gonna I was gonna add, I think in smaller organizations where there's perhaps an HR team of, of one or two people, Eric, I think it's even more important, yeah, because mm -hmm. they need all the time that they 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 need to so much optimize their time because they need to do everything. So I think that it's not a question of whether or not it makes sense uh, for smaller organizations. I do think as you said that it's always of course finding a balance between um, are we gonna indeed invest in a tool? That is, is that worth it, or are we gonna uh, digitize, so to speak, in an Excel sheet? But I think um, the the relevance of uh, the digital capabilities remains the same, uh, also in smaller organizations. Um, all right, Eric, I have a few more questions for you, uh, and then I think it's time for us to wrap up. So. Here uh, is a question uh, that is, uh, what are the risks of not moving fast enough to develop our digital HR capabilities? That's an excellent question. Um, I think I, I referenced this report already, but there was a, a study among business leaders um, and they asked them, what is, the, what is the key thing that we need to build today in 2020? Uh, the report was from this year. And what do you think in five years are the, are the key capability that we need to build? And uh, for 2020, it was about digital adoption. So how do we adopt digital tools and, and digital uh, uh, processes in a faster way? And for 2025, the number one priority was, again, digital adoption. Um, so you know, what is the risk of not doing it today is that in five years, you'll still have the same you know, annoying problem. So if you do it today uh, and you already upskill your organization to a, to a sufficiently high level, you'll have profit you know, for the next five years. And otherwise, you know, you still have to do it in five years and you won't get the payback. So in the end, the, the business risk of not doing it fast enough is you know, uh, having an organization that's not viable and that it's losing its position in the marketplace. And I think that's you know, when we talk about HR having an impact, that's where you can have an impact. And if you don't act, then you also have an impact because you let the ship sink. So. I, I think that covers it fairly well. Um, and, and, and that's the direction that I would go for. So do it today rather than tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you'll have an impact either way. But I mean, I don't really think you want to go for the second impact because, you know, that brings up all kinds of titanic memories, uh, Eric. So that's not where we want to be headed, of course, within HR. I have a last um, um question here. Actually, I might have two questions. Um, so first, question coming from Kutsen, and it is, what are the challenges when building digital capabilities in HR? Ooh. <laughs> we, we, we can mm -hmm. do a whole live episode about this. The challenges- Let's, name, let's build... name two challenges. <laughs> Ooh, you're limiting my answer nearly. Now I need to, to, to pick. I think one of the biggest challenge is uh, the, 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 the current skill gap. If you look at, at digital, and I referred to this in my previous answer, uh, when you look at digital skills, HR is, is at a fairly low level. Um, so that, that's, I think, the first biggest challenge that you need to tackle. And I think the, the, the second challenge is about the importance of you know, building digital, um, uh, digital capabilities, not just for HR, but for the rest of the business. It's not just an HR party. It's you know, the whole business is involved. But HR needs to be leading, but the whole business will be involved. Um, and if you if you don't take that perspective and you just look at it as an HR problem, then you're, you know, also to refer to the previous answer again, you need to have that urgency because if you don't fix it in HR, it's going to be way harder to fix it in the broader business. And that also needs to happen. Uh, so I would say those are the two key challenges that, uh, challenges that I'm seeing. Really. I was, I was going to say here, Eric, I was going to say, then you're going to miss the boat. Anyhow, uh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's move on from this, uh, from this boat talk now i have here one last question for you um which is um from a thai bad bike and i really hope i pronounce your name correctly um how should the protection of information shared between uh hr and it departments uh how should the protection of the information be when the organization is moving towards digitization yeah, so when, when it comes to data protection and data privacy, um, it's hard to give one answer because that will depend on your local uh, regulations, of course. In Europe, the situation is very different, for example, than, than in the US. 
Um, so, so when it comes to, you know, when you talk about digital tools and digital alignment, the horizontal communication between digital tools, you're essentially talking about data and how data will be used by different systems and how data will be processed for different purposes as well. Um, so the the you know when you look at regulation, regulation becomes then very very important uh, in the implementation of these practices, um, specifically in in GDPR terms. You know you can't process data for a different purpose than the purpose for which it was collected and the purpose for which people explicitly gave uh, permission. So in that context, you know you need to make sure that the data that you have that you have a vision about it. What will I do with the data, and can I give get permission from the user to process that data for all the different different aims that I have, and are those aims really justified? Do those aims enable the business to be more successful? Or are we just, you know, using the data for, um, because the CEO wants to see a nice report and, you know, he isn't really doing much with it. Probably when the CEO wants to see a report, he is doing something with it because he'll be, a, or she will be a incredibly busy. Um, you know, so that, that might be a bad example, but, but looking at the data and seeing, hey, what is the use and does it actually add value to the business, I think is, you know, then also very important to go back to the, to the regulation issue and the, the, the data protection issue. You need to sit with IT, with your legal counsel, your data yes. protection uh, officer uh, that you have in most large organizations, uh, um, you, you need to sit with the different stakeholders, think about this, and also with the employee groups, you know, involve them in the process as well, uh, and explain what the data will be used for. Um, I think the, the more transparent you are, the more you can build a culture of trust where people are happy to give their data uh, uh, and have the data be processed if they see a tangible result, you know, if it will help the business win, people are committed to the business, then they will be more likely to give permission to it. So it's a complicated uh, or complex question rather um, with, yeah. with, you know, with different answers depending on, on where you're located, where you're based. Uh, but it is, you know, without a doubt, very important. And I'm glad you brought it up because uh, it's something you need yeah. to take into account. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a great question. I think it's a great, great question to end with as well. And I do think that this is something, Eric, that needs to be uh, covered at the start of uh, any uh, project that is going to involve um, digitalization and data, and especially when we talk about employee data, of course. So I think this was a fantastic uh, question. I also think it was a good answer. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Eric. Um, and that brings us to uh, the end of this episode. So let me start uh, by thanking you, Eric, for joining us today, for sharing um, your experience and for um, yeah, learning us something about building digital capabilities within HR teams. Thank you very much, Neely. Pleasure being here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to say uh, thank you and uh, yeah, goodbye, Eric. Um, from me to you, um, thank you so much for watching this episode of uh, AIHR Live. It was the last episode of the year. Um, if you are uh, curious to um, uh, know what kind of uh, HR skills that you can uh, develop, and if you're looking at digital HR skills or other HR skills that you want to develop in 2021, uh, I invite you to uh, hop over to our site AIHR.com uh, because all our certificate programs are open at the moment. So whether you want to uh, build on skills regarding learning and development or um, uh, becoming an HR business partner 2.0 or people analytics, you can find all of them uh, on our site, AIHR.com. So go and have a look and start um, building on these skills in the new year. Thank you so much for joining today. Stay safe and I hope to see you very soon again for a new episode of AHR Live in 2021. Thank you and goodbye.